It's the Kansas preview on Frogs Insider. Let's jump right in. Hey, Frog fans. Welcome into another episode of Frogs Insider presented by the Flying Tea Club. My name is Jamie Plunkett. My co-host, Melissa Trubos, will be along shortly. Uh, two great interviews on the show today. Very excited for you to hear about them. We're going to get into those in just a moment. But first, I'd like for you to hear about our presenting sponsor, Flying Tea Club. Big fans of the FTC, TCU's NIL Collective. They are the only NIL collective for TCU. They support over 110 student athletes. They work with a bunch of organizations in and around the city of Fort Worth. Super thankful for our partnership with the Flying T Club. You can go over to flyingteaclub.com and check them out, see who they're sponsoring, who they work with as far as organizations go, and how you can get involved. I know they'd love to partner with you as much as they've partnered with us. So flyingteaclub.com, check out the Flying T Club today to see how you can get involved in that. Also, a big thanks to Dave Campbell's Texas Football, the Republic of Football Network. We're still a part of it. Even if uh, Melissa's out there arguing on Twitter with the Dave Campbell's Texas football senior college football writer, uh, they still allow us to be a part of the network. It's a really fun group of of shows, y'all. If you go wherever you get your podcasts, search Republic of Football Network, it will pop up. You'll get our show every week, Frogs Insider. You'll also get... um, <clears throat> a show for every D1 football program in the state of Texas. That's TCU, SMU, North Texas, Texas, Texas A&M, UTSA, Texas State, UTEP, Rice, Sam Houston State. Uh, I'm forgetting one or two. Baylor and Texas Tech, those were the two I think I'm forgetting. Um, all of those in one single podcast feed, which means you get as much up-to-date information as anybody could on every single D1 football program in the state of Texas. Very cool, very cool, very cool. If you only want TCU stuff, we've got that for you as well. Search Frogs Insider wherever you get your shows or on YouTube, and you'll find all of our content there. Um, And just so you know, because I did get this comment a couple times this week, if you're listening to this episode, you'll notice that it's not in the Republic of Football Network feed. Well, that's because we only do one show a week on that feed. That's what they've asked of all of us. So our second show goes on just the Frogs Insider feed. I should probably say this on the next episode, too, because that one's in the Republic of of Football Network feed, but our previews only on the Frogs Insider feed, only on the YouTube channel. So it's really important that you guys are over there, making sure that you've got all of that uh, sweet, sweet preview goodness, because the previews honestly have been better than the reviews uh, lately, the last couple weeks for TCU football. But uh, I think that's all the business that we've got for you today dave campbell's texas football big shout out to them and shout out to the flying tea club as well uh oh we're closing in on 700 subscribers on the youtube channel make sure you get over there subscribe to the channel turn on notifications so you can see every time our videos go live we do all of the podcasts and video so you can watch the interview with all of our guests see their faces it's a better experience that way you can cover up my face on there if you really need to, because I do have a, a face for radio. But uh, I think it's fun over there on the YouTube channel because we've also got all of our midweek post game stuff. We've got press conferences with Sonny Dykes and players over there. We're going to have some more interview content over there soon. So you're going to want to get over to the YouTube channel. Make sure you're subscribed today. And like we mentioned in the last episode, when we get to a thousand subscribers, we might do something fun. We're going to do another challenge similar to the smelling salts but we're also going to do something fun for everybody that has subscribed over there so make sure that you're a part of it make sure you go over to the youtube channel and subscribe today okay let's jump in we got two really fun guests for you guys today super excited to have them both on the show melissa sits down with shreya slada the kc star sports writer to break down tcu kansas uh it's a fantastic conversation really enjoyed it throughout Uh, And I know you guys as well. And then stick around because after that, I sit down with Kendall Rogers of D1 Baseball. We talk about NIL and scholarship news in the world of college baseball. We also talk about what went wrong with TCU baseball last year and what TCU fans can look forward to about the 2025 version of the baseball team. So two great interviews. Hope you stick around for both of them. But let's go ahead and jump into Melissa's conversation right now with Shreya Slada of the KC Star. 
Hello, everybody. Welcome to another preview edition of the Frogs Insider Podcast, a member of the Dave Campbell's Texas Football Republic of Football Podcast Network and brought to you, as always, by the excellent folks at the Flying Tea Club over at TCU. I am super excited today to be joined by the Casey Star reporter covering Kansas athletics, Shreyas Lada. Shreyas, I uh, really appreciate you taking some time to, you laugh, so did I nail it or did I get it totally yes. wrong? I've, okay. <laughs> I, I got a pronunciation lesson prior to uh, hit record, but then I doubted myself the minute I started to talk. So we know how these things go. Uh, but Shreyas, really appreciate you taking some time and, and jumping on to preview this game this weekend. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Excited for Yeah. You. Of course. So uh, both these teams, I think, coming into the final game of September, thought they'd be in very different places. Um, Kansas was one of the dark horse picks to be atop the Big 12. I think TCU internally had a lot of confidence about what their season could look like four games in. And I think it's fair to say both of these programs and fan bases are pretty disappointed where their team sits at this moment. So from your perspective, what has kind of gone wrong for Kansas this season, or was this kind of to be expected based on all the changes that happened on that program? You know, I think it was an interesting start to the season because I think you look back at the last three weeks and you see a Kansas team that probably looks like they're a young team with the way they've blown a lot of fourth quarter leads, but they have 30 guys who are graduating at the end of this year. The expectations, like you alluded to, were, you know, Big 12 championship within this program. They thought this is the year. They're going to go and be representing uh, the conference as one of the teams in the Big 12 championship. And, you know, they're hoping for college football playoff hopes and and all that. And it's become kind of a disaster start to the season. They've, you know, against West Virginia, they had an 11-point lead. They blew it in five minutes. Uh, this continues a, a trend of them blowing fourth-quarter leads. Uh, they've allowed three straight games where they've allowed a fourth-quarter touchdown to go ahead. Um, you know, obviously Illinois looks better than they did last year. So, you know, that's, it's a loss, but it's not as bad as what we once thought, but now UNLV with everything going on over there, Ooh, it's kind of a wow. mess. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, I think the biggest thing right now is Jalen Daniels has not looked like Jalen Daniels looked like in 2022 or even 2023. I think, you know, he looks like a guy who hasn't played enough football in the last two years. I mean, between the last two years combined, I think 12 games of football on the, on the field and, uh, I think that rust and the new offensive coordinator and, and just that instability in the offensive end, I think it's been the biggest issue. Their running back is still doing great things. And Devin Neal, four straight games, 100 plus yards. You know, he's the star that he is. But Jalen has been the, uh, I think, reason you can really point to and say, hey, if he didn't throw this many interceptions or maybe you take off one or two of those picks from the last couple of games, you'd be talking about a Kansas team that's probably three and one, maybe even four and out. Uh, you know, that he has nine turnovers and four games and Jeez. it's been just tough to watch if you're a Kansas fan, I think, because he was so good in 2022. You know, you, I think the last time these two teams played, he was a Heisman contender, like, you know, yeah. dark horse Heisman contender. And I, the, I've been on the beat since that Liberty bowl game. Okay. And, uh, you know, that was my first real time watching him. I, I just came away thinking, man, this guy's so good. He has not been <laughs> good uh, as good as that. Since I mean, he was good last year before he got hurt, but it's been uh, a weird, really weird thing to watch because he's an older quarterback. You don't expect to see this, but you never know, especially after the shoulder injury, then the back injury kept him out after three games last year. So I think they're just trying to figure out what's wrong. And, and I mean, I know it's hard to kind of make that assumption of what's wrong, but how much of this do you think is injuries and rust and how much is this Jeff Grimes. I, I mean, obviously, Lance Leopold had so much success uh, with with Andy uh, Kolonek, Kol Kolotek, whatever. Um, I, I've got enough difficult names to say I'm good. Um, but you know, like like how how much of this is is a changing system with an old quarterback and an old quarterback that has dealt with some injury issues and dealt with some some rust. And, and how much of this do you think can just be attributed to he's just started the season a little bit off. I think it's a little bit of both. You know, it, it's something I, I was discussing. I, I do a film breakdown with uh, former KU quarterback Carter Stanley, and mm -hmm. we were talking about this yesterday for film breakdown. It, it's even the throws that he's making, they don't seem like throws that are easy for the receivers to catch. These guys are having to jump in the air, or kind of, you know, lunge to the left, lunge to the right. It feels like a lot of it's a mix of rust, uh, a mix of mechanics not being as form, you know, as sound as, as he typically is. And, and, uh, and definitely a Jeff Grimes, you know, offense has not been as good as any Kotal Nicky offense. I mean, 
I don't think they've uh, done a great job of putting Jalen Daniels in a position to succeed uh, as well as Andy Kotelnicki did. And, and, you know, we can see it because that offense at Penn State is putting up record yardage, it feels like, every other week. And, uh, you know, he does a great job of, uh, you know, like he's going to be a, probably a head coach sooner than later in Andy Kotelnicki. And, and Jeff Krabs is a good coach, not to say that, but it, it just feels like there hasn't been the easiness of the offense, you know, like the stuff that made Jalen look as good as he did uh, in this offense. There's no, there's not as much motion. The tight end usage hasn't been there as much. And that's attributed to the tight ends are good. Not as good as Mason Fairchild last year, but even the, the wide receivers just don't lick in sync. And, and today Jeff Grimes talked about it in the press conference, like, you know, that's something we have to improve upon along with pass protection. But, you know, this is a wide receiver group that is old. They've been with Jalen since, you know, day one, they should not have any issues. There shouldn't be, you know, lack of in sync, but you know, that's, that's the thing. It goes back to, he hasn't played football a full season of football really since 2021. Well, you know, you kind of speak to that and, and two years ago, um, play or uh, last year, sorry, playing primarily with a backup quarterback and Jason Bean, um, Kansas was fourth in the conference in scoring averaging almost 35 points a game. Four games into this season, they're ninth in the conference and scoring at just 28 points a game. And that's with their starter, who was, again, a, a guy who came into the season potentially as a, a, you know, a lot of people said, hey, if he stays healthy, this is a guy that could be a Heisman candidate and could elevate Kansas to a Big 12 championship. Um, you know, Lance Leopold did such an incredible job so quickly getting to Kansas. I mean, he seemed to almost turn that program around just immediately how does, you know, I think we saw this with Matt Campbell too, when when guys come into programs that are so so morbid and have such a, a long road to, to getting back to relevancy, they're often given a longer leash. But when they have so much success immediately, suddenly the bar is raised. Where does the fan base and where do you think administration at Kansas sit on Lance Leopold? I doubt nothing, there's nothing that could happen this year to get his seat hot, but is some of that shine wearing off or do they understand that this wasn't going to be a hey, we're going to start winning and we're going to keep winning forever situation. Yeah, it's interesting because I think this administration was expecting, you know, a a Big 12 championship or hoping for it or, you know, because with Lance every year, it felt like it's better than the previous year. He's he's a program builder. He's done a a tremendous job with this program. And and I think a lot of, you know, the administration understands that next year is going to be a step back. There's going to be 30 guys that, you know, leave the team who have been there for a long time. A lot of those guys are less miles guys who were recruited to this Kansas mm-hmm. team. And, you know, that's one thing. And it's something I've talked about is, you know, Lance Leipold is a tremendous coach. He does a great job of building a program. He has not hit on his guys yet in the recruiting class. You know, he hasn't had a, a really thoroughbred recruiting class where every guy, you know, there's a good amount of contributors. There's been a few in each recruiting class, but He's going to be really, really tested in this offseason with the transfer portal, with the guys he's bringing in in the, in the high school classes. And, I mean, you know, I think the expectation from this KU fan base is it's just massively disappointing. I, you know, my mentions are a dumpster fire after every game because it's it's filled with Man. guys saying, <laughs> fire, fire this or, you know, bench him or do that. or And, and, it, and the thing is, it, Lance said it best. It's not something you can blame a singular person on. This Kansas team is – can equally blamed in different spectrums. But at the end of the day, I think a lot of the issues would be minimized if you had Jalen Daniels playing even to 60% of his capabilities or 70%. I mean, the one thing we could always count on with Jalen Daniels is he could he was always great at completing passes. Like even a, a game against a bad, you know, West Virginia secondary, one of the worst in the nation, he puts him 180 yards and he's like 15 to 26. That's not great. I know that it passed the ball, you know, but like that should be a game that Jalen Daniels would absolutely destroy. He would cook, you know, in that game. That's the kind of get right game that everyone would say. And even then he just he hasn't looked. And I, it's for me, it's just, I, I, I don't know what to say because it's like, it, you don't expect it to see something like that from a senior quarterback that has expectations and, and dreams of playing in the NFL one day. And, you know, obviously I think he's his own toughest critic. So it's, it's hard for him, I'm sure. But also, you know, you have the fan base. It's a vocal minority, but still a minority uh, that is on Twitter saying he should be benched. And I think we're getting to that point and stage where if he has another game with two, three interceptions, you got to have a serious talk about whether or not he should start the next game. 
Well, I think the biggest cure for Jalen Daniels' uh, ills can definitely be playing TCU. Um, so <laughs> you're welcome. We may have just saved his starting job before the game even starts. Um, this is a TCU team that is allowing has allowed. Um, God, God, I can't even. I think it's like 589 yards over the last two games. Um, UCF obviously came in with an incredible rushing attack. SMU had really struggled to move the ball effectively, but again, TCU is the cure for your ills if you need to get the running game going. Um, and so for Kansas um, with. Jaylen Jalen Daniels struggling, but as Sonny Dyke says, still has one of the most effective and diverse running games um, in the conference. And it's probably, he said, I think he said in his press conference Tuesday, the best he's seen, um, which is terrifying considering what UCF did um, to this team. So if, if Jalen Daniels mm -hmm. only has to attempt maybe 15 passes, I, I think Kevin Jennings at SMU only attempted 12 or 15 passes, and they could just turn the ball over to Devin Neal, who you mentioned, and then let Jalen get loose a little bit in the running game. Uh, that might be the get right game you've been waiting for. You do not need to throw the ball against TCU. So there, there will be plenty of opportunities to do so. Um, do, do you think that that, that, is, that that they can just lean on the run game and kind of wear the Horn Frogs down uh, on Saturday afternoon? Yeah, I, I think, you know, the one thing with this, you know, Jeff Grimes OC thing I, I've been waiting on is for a better balance between run and pass. Sometimes You're not going to see like that Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't expect it. I don't expect it to be honest with you. Right? You know, like because I was looking at TCU and you know they're giving up 150 yards on in, in the air, which is pretty good, right? But then you look at how much how they're giving up. Yeah, yeah, how many times they're like, passes. Yeah, it's yeah, funny. yeah. And I was like, I was looking at well, you know, Devin Neal is probably going to have a, a heyday, you know, because he put up 100 yards at half, I think, last game or, or you know the game before that. He's, he's a tremendous back. He's a guy that's going to end up in the NFL. Yeah. He's a guy that was getting NFL looks last year. You know, I, it's going to be really interesting because Kansas does, has Devin Neal, but they also have Daniel Heishaw, who is great, yes. you know, kind of yeah. brutalizing back, right? Last game, he had 72 yards on nine carries. So, God, we're so you know. screwed. We are so yeah. screwed, screwed sure. This is going to be be a long afternoon, Frog fans. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting because, I mean, to be honest with you, like, I was looking at it and I was like, if it turns into a shootout, I really don't know if Kansas can keep up with the way Jalen's looked, you know, so far this year. You know, like, I I, I mean, every time I think it's going to be a, a turnaround game for Kansas, they've gone out and done something. And I'm like, oh, my God, what was I thinking? You know, like, what, what, like I had this team, you know, like, the year before I had them winning nine. I think they won nine. And this year I was like, okay, I'll keep going bold. I, I'm looking at the schedule. They have a relatively easy schedule. I'm gonna. I think they're gonna go to the Big 12 Championship. I think this team is ready. I'm having them winning 11, losing to K State, and I look like you know I have egg on my face right now. And you know now everything that I thought about Kansas football and what I know and you know what I expected and, and just the feel around the program it's gone out the window. I think until they stop the spiral of losing, everything and anything is on the table. We could be talking about five and seven. We could be talking about seven and five. We could talk about them running the table. But I need to see them win on Saturday for me to come out there and say anything definitively because they should have won against West Virginia. They should have won against Illinois. They should have won against UNLV. But they've been their own worst enemy. And a team that is old and experienced should not be blown fourth quarter leads like the way they are. I'd like to invite you, invite you to our support group. We started it in 2023 um, after TCU lost to Colorado and then the wheels immediately came off. And so um, I want to say I understand your pain. I can both sympathize and empathize. Um, and one of us is going to get a glimmer of hope um, after Saturday. And one of us is going to basically have to throw in the towel because I really do feel like this is almost an elimination game. I, I do think that we will see... Um, potentially two one-loss teams in the Big 12 championship. And I could see a one-loss and a two-loss team just because of how uneven this league has been. But that team that picks up that second loss before September has ended in conference play is going to be in an absolute world of hurt. Um, and you you do not want to be uh, mm -hmm. you do not want to be that team. And, and so um, I, I think it's going to be very, very I think both teams feel like their backs are against the wall. Um, you alluded to this a, a little bit um, and, and that this could be a shootout and could could Kansas keep up. I mean, I, I think that's the one shot TCU has to lose. We know TCU has not shown any ability to stop the run, but we have seen them put points on the board now not through the running game but that but josh hoover has yeah. he had a very bad day saturday he would be the first to tell you that um, but he's put up huge numbers going into that and he had been completing passes at a high rate not turning the ball over um how much success can this tcu passing attack have against the kansas defense and if tcu is going to figure out how to run the football does kansas provide enough uh 
Is their front strong enough to keep it from being against Kansas this weekend? Or do you think that, that TCU might be able to get things going in that, that regard? You know, I think it's really interesting because this Kansas secondary was a major strength point coming into the season. You know, Kobe Bryant and Mello Dotson were guys who got preseason and all, uh, you know, Big 12 nominations. They had some nominations last year. They were tremendous. They haven't been as good as they uh, have for last year. They haven't been able to get the turnovers that they've created last year. I think it's going to be really interesting because – Garrett Green, he was an okay quarterback. I wouldn't yeah. say he's amazing, but he's a solid, you know, Big 12 quarterback. He kind of cooked a lot of these guys out there on Saturday. He had a really, you know, he had a nice field day. Uh, this thing, the one thing with Kansas's defense is they've done a decent job stopping the run game, but they haven't done a good job of stopping quarterbacks that scramble a little bit. They've done a really bad job. I know Hoover doesn't do it too yeah. much, but I could oh, see him nice. bringing that out a little bit because. Kansas has not been able to contain the QB scramble outside of the Illinois game. And that was something that, you know, they had experience with Luke Altemeyer last year when, you know, carved him up for 80 yards, I think a 72-yard touchdown. And, you know, they didn't do a good job against UNLV, you know, and they didn't do a good job against Garrett Green. Um, and uh, I think it's going to be really interesting because I I think the secondary expects them to be better and expects them to bounce back after they played against, you know, West Virginia. I think they underestimated the West Virginia receiving core. Um, the Kansas D-line is good. They haven't done a – I mean, they had three sacks against West Virginia, but they only had two QB hurries or QB pressures outside of that. They haven't been – there isn't one selective guy in that you know line that I can sit there and say, that's the guy who gets a quarterback. If they get to the quarterback, it seems like they kind of share it amongst themselves. There's no one guy like last year where they had Austin Booker, who's now the Chicago Bears, and the year before that they had Lonnie Phelps, who gets the quarterback. There hasn't been a guy that emerges for Kansas like that. Um, I think they – could do a little better job of getting through uh, pressure wise, but you know, three sacks, three sacks, you can't say too much about it, but you know, there have been times where I felt quarterbacks just had too much time to sit around and throw and pick apart. And if that happens, especially with the way the offense is played and turn the ball over uh, a good Kansas defense could be tested real quick. Cause they were exhausted. You know, they've been exhausted at the end of these games because they're just really not getting the chance to sit down because you know, Jalen Daniels has had uh, a rough year. And, and it's it's funny you say that about TCU. I'm, I'm a Georgia grad and a Georgia fan. Oh, God. You know, <laughs> I, you know what? I feel like you should have disclosed this information before you confirmed this interview because that's – man, I was enjoying this so much, too. Like, I, we were in such a great place. I was like, oh, we're going to be friends. This is going to be – no, yeah. you ruined it. You ended it. <laughs> Yeah, so for me, I had a great 2022. It was my favorite. Like, you know, I had a, I, I enjoyed it. I was like, run up the score, you know? Like, I understood it. I mean, I was happy for, you know, the Big 12 to have somebody to represent them. And, sure, you know, sure you are. This thing. But I was like, listen, I saw TCU there. I was like, okay, I wonder how much they'll win by. I didn't think they'd win by the way they, they won. You know, they could have probably scored 70 that day, yeah. uh, honestly. Um, yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, I it's weird because, you know, it, it's – just the expectation around this Kansas football program is like what they have for basketball almost what basketball, you know, being a Georgia basketball fan as well. It's like, you know, the inverse almost. And it's really interesting because this fan base has built so much hype around this season. This was like, they're supposed to be like 2008, 2009 year. And like that 2009 year, it was kind of disappointing. You know, they, Mangino got fired and, uh, you know, I don't expect life old or anything like that to be fired, but it, it does feel like, at least so far, it's stepped back from everything Kansas was building towards. And they've kind of, you know, they're not playing at home. They're playing at Arrowhead and they're playing at, you know, like all that, you know, factors in. But you have, you're at, if you're Kansas, you're asking for money from donors for the stadium yeah. that costs a ton of money. You need to win football games because if it doesn't happen this year, and I, I'm really curious about how many people show up. I don't know how well TCU travels, I think relatively well. But, huge fan base in Kansas City. So I think this will be a decent TCU turnout, despite okay, yeah. the record. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see how many people show up in that stadium because, you know, like if you have 35 or 30,000 people show up for a Kansas game, that that's not a great look, especially yeah. around the hype. And I don't blame people, right? It's This team has demoralized a lot of people in the hope they have. And, and I think I've started to shift my expectations that, you know, I, I had a radio interview this morning and I'd said it, but it's almost like, now it doesn't matter what you thought was going to happen for the season. We are in conference play. They start a conference play with an L. Let's just see if they can win a football game. And then we can start talking about bowl games and that. Otherwise, we're going to sit here and talk about the Armed Forces Bowl or whatever. 
stuff that Kansas fans don't want to hear. But until they get put together two straight W's, it, it's going to be uh, a question of how good this Kansas team is. And I'm sure it's the same with TCU, right? You want to see them string together something to show that they are a legitimate contender for an actual decent bowl game or even the Big 12 title. Well, I, I mean, I, like, it, it feels stupid to say it four games into the season, but at TCU at two and two, Kansas at one at three, this almost, at least what I look at this at TCU is, is a almost a bowl elimination game. If you don't win this game on Saturday, the road to six wins looks really difficult for this team. And, you know, and I think Kansas isn't that far off. Their schedule might not be quite as daunting, but like TCU has not gotten to the difficult part of their schedule. I think most TCU fans thought worst case scenario, we'd be sitting at three and one, four games in. Um, and, and it's not just the losses, it's the way they got handled from from the middle of the third quarter against UCF to the entirety of the SMU game. Uh, if they can't go out on the road and show that that they still have the heart to play, it's going to feel like it did in 2023 when everybody just kind of quit. Like it was, mm-hmm. and I think that's the thing. And I'm sure that's exactly what you described around Kansas is that it, it's not just the losing, it's having the expectations and, and good reasons for the expectations and seeing the rug pulled out from under you. And then on top of that, not playing in your home stadium, your superstar quarterback not living up to the high expectations and the hype. He's finally healthy, but it, it, it's really difficult when you're trying to build momentum and build a program to have this kind of season. And again, too, on top of it, and this is how TC feels, in such a wide open Big 12. Like the opportunity, it was there for the taking. And now it's just like, who the heck is going to take it? And I don't think either of our fan bases think it's going to be us. So, but a win win Saturday, you can start turning things around and get back on track. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about playing in Arrowhead. Um, Mm -hmm. I've I've actually never gotten to to go. I'll be up at the game on Saturday. I'm really excited about it because anytime you can cover your college team in an NFL stadium, it's cool. But playing in an NFL stadium as a college team when that's your home field not quite as cool. What do you kind of think that that experience is going to be like? What is the environment like? Uh, it, it does it give a good, like fan, like does it feel electric, or is it going to be pretty down? Not just because of the the way the season has started, but because of the stadium as a whole. It'll be a little interesting. So I personally have not seen it because the the first two games were at the soccer stadium. Yeah. Children's oh, Park. that's right. So, yeah. 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 So it'll be interesting. Like I, you know, my closest venture to Arrowhead is when I've had to cover some Royals games for the star over the summer or whatever. And it's right next to yeah. uh, Arrowhead. I still haven't had the chance to go to a chiefs game. You know, I'm a big Patriots fan, but it's, uh, you it's, it's are the worst. We like <laughs> Patriot and a Georgia. I mean, like what, yeah. what is, what is life like in years you don't get to win a championship and how many of well, those years have you experienced like three in your entire life? Come well, on. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Boston sports fan. So it, it's, it's, uh, you know, I grew up with Boston College as my team, so it's a good year. Okay. For oh, we can relate yeah. there. My sister and my brother-in-law went to BC, so we found a connection yeah. point here. I, dude, that we should have made this podcast about Boston College because how fun are they to watch? Cassiatos, yes. Bill yeah. O'Brien, like who would have thought that this is the magic formula to potentially win in the ACC? Way more interesting than either of our teams. A hundred percent. It's 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 going to be interesting. I think you know a lot of these guys are excited about playing in Arrowhead. I know a lot of them are Chiefs fans, so there's like, oh my god, you know, like that allure. Uh, we were talking to Bryce Foster about it, uh, Texas A&M transfer. Uh, he's the center for Kansas, and he's like, you know, I think it's pretty cool, but I think we got that little pregame jitters out of the way a little bit because they had some practices in Arrowhead and in Children's Mercy before the season started. Um, you know, obviously it doesn't really matter until you're there. You never really know how it is. And, and I think, you know, if Kansas can get 50,000, 55,000 people to come out and watch this game, I think that's a, a really big thing. I, I really am curious to see what the stadium count is and, and I think at the end of the day, like it matters to them more so because Kansas is honestly, essentially, I think Kansas City's team. It's not Missouri. It's not Kansas State. It's it's Kansas. And you want to showcase uh, a good showing and ideally a win because I know Kansas has a lot of recruits coming in. I think it's the most recruits they've had all year come to this game because like, hey, like you're telling recruits, hey, look, we're playing an airway, you know, like maybe that could be you in a couple of years, you know, like. All that stuff matters to these guys. And and I think, you know, at the end of the day, it'll be really interesting to see if how many people show up, number one. And number two, uh, if there are a good amount of people show up, is it a sizable TCU contingent that is showing up? And are they loud in the stadium? Is that going to be an issue? Uh, because, I mean, I, I'm looking at the TCU game. I'm looking at the Colorado game. I'm looking at the Iowa State game. Those are three games where they have good amount of people in the fan bases and especially if those teams are decent still, you know, yeah. at the end of the year, because they're end of the year games, 
where they could travel well and they could, you know, be a, an issue, especially Iowa State. I don't know if you've been in yeah. Iowa State. Game. Oh, they're, it's the, they're the, the <laughs> Iowa State and West Virginia, the two craziest fan bases in the conference, two best tailgating scenes that I've mm. ever seen. It's incredible. It's incredible. It, it'll be a lot of fun. I think it'll be a good opportunity for both teams to kind of see what they're made of. And and I think, like you said, it, it's a get right game for both of them. And it's kind of like a, a you know, Lance has alluded to the fact that it's not a, uh, you know, a lot of season left, but how many, how many weeks can you keep saying that? Like we yeah. were you know, next week, it'll be Arizona state after that KU has its first bye week, you know, and we're essentially halfway through the season at that point, you know, yeah. that there's only so many weeks left in this, in this uh, season that you can say that. And, and I think they just have to string together some get wins if they want to, you know, right the ship. And more importantly, you're ideally hoping if you're a Kansas fan, they need to be TCU, they need to be Arizona State. You have that bye week, then they need to be Houston. And then you go in and you play the biggest rival that you have in Kansas State outside of Missouri. You haven't beat them in 15 years. 15 years of losing. Yeah. You know, they this was the year that they thought they're going to beat Kansas State from so many players that I talked to. You know, everyone thinks that this is the year. This is the, you know, they, they're not even like worried about it, you know, coming into the season. So who knows? After, who knows? after what we saw against BYU, I, I'd say Kansas still has just as good of a shot to beat Kansas State as they did before the season started. That's fair. That's fair. That's what I'm saying. This, this conference is wide open. I really don't think there's a definitive, besides Utah, I haven't really seen anybody definitively like, you know, above anybody else. And I think that's yeah. good for, for TCU in Kansas because if you string together some wins, then you're right back in the conversation yeah. for a Big 12 title. It's going to be fascinating. I think this being the first time that they've played at Arrowhead will probably, I think a lot of people will come out out of curiosity and just getting to go to a game in Arrowhead at a price point that's a little bit more affordable than it would be on a Sunday. So I, I think that it will be pretty, and I think we're all just kind of hoping maybe Taylor shows up. Like there's no reason for her to be there, but maybe Taylor Swift shows up. I don't know. I'm going to be checking the suite just to make sure. I just, you know, maybe she's really into college football. We just don't know. Um, yeah. Okay. Last question. It's going to be a two-parter. Uh, number one, you're probably way more interested in a different game this weekend than you are in the game that you're covering. Because So I, I want to ask your prediction on Georgia-Alabama, but I also want to, want to get your professional prediction on what you, you – don't, if you don't want to give a score prediction, that's okay. But, but is this a game that Kansas gets back on track and gets a win, um, or does TCU come in and pull off the very minor upset? And how are your dogs going to do against, uh, against the Tide this weekend? You know, I think it's going to be really interesting, this game, TCU. I think it go a lot of different ways. Every week I have basically predicted Kansas to win, and eventually sometime they will, they'll they'll be correct. I think I <laughs> Fair had, enough. Fair uh, enough. You know, like, you know, like uh, I think I had them – I think I had UNLV covering, so at least I had that right. But um, other you than that – You literally might know, have changed college football because of Kansas losing that game. Like yeah. the, the, the <laughs> contra- contractual holdouts midseason might have happened because Ridiculous. UNLV beat Kansas. Yeah, it's insane. Ridiculous. Um. I was like texting Carter Sandley about that. I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe Kansas lost to this guy who threw 86 yards and now yeah. he's not playing. Hey, West blame the year. TCU <laughs> for Colorado for the Colorado hype train yeah. last year. Blame Kansas for fundamentally changing college football as we know it again. It's fine. A little, a little butterfly effect. I think it'll be a game that I think Kansas can win this game because it's at home. I think if this is on the road. I think I'd feel a little less confident about it. But I think, you know, if if this is what they are, and, you know, the coaching staff is both reiterated. They think Jalen took I, Jalen Daniels took a step forward uh, on Saturday, which I don't know. I don't necessarily agree with that assessment. But if the step forward is from three interceptions to one interception and a fumble, I guess that's technically a step that's forward. Uh, you know, but, it, you know, it, it's it'll be interesting. I think if it becomes a shootout, uh, I would not feel confident if I was a Kansas fan. If it's anything other than a shootout, I think Kansas should win this game even if it's relatively close. I, I think it'll be like something like 35, 31, or 35, 28. I think it'll be a one score game. Yeah, I think that's fair. And 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 Georgia on top, I'm assuming. <laughs> I think so. I hope so. I don't know. They, you know, I get nervous anytime they play Alabama. I think, you know, the one team I hate them playing is Alabama. Like, I, I don't get nervous about any other game, but especially Alabama. But you know, Sabin isn't there, so I feel a little more confident. You know, Tuscaloosa is always tough to play at. Um, I was texting my friends back home about this. I was like, you know, there's one overly confident Georgia fan in the group chat. And then everybody else is like, dude, we're going to lose. We're going to destroy it. You know, it's like the cautious jinx optimism. And then he was like, nah, man, I've been watching the practice videos. Have you seen what's coming? I was like, yeah, they were probably practicing hard last year too, when they lost the SEC championship game, that they should probably should have won. So hey, until they, they win, I don't, I, I don't, 
here, you know? TCU has had its best week of practice the last three weeks going into <laughs> embarrassing losses. So I know how that goes. Um, I, I think, like, I think, I think Georgia handles Bama pretty easily. The game I can't wait to watch is Georgia, Texas. That is going to be Ooh, potential be game of the year situation there. Um, where can people find your work? Um, where can they find you on socials? Where can they, where can they read your stuff uh, at the star? Yeah, you can find it at thecasystar.com. Uh, I also post a lot of links on Twitter to all, all my articles and film breakdown stuff. Um, my Twitter's S H R E nine um, eight. Yeah, uh, but yeah, those those places are probably the, the best to find my work. And uh, excited for this game. It should be, I think, a fun one. Listen, up until about the last 12 minutes when you dropped that you were a Georgia alum, uh, this was a blast. I really enjoyed having the conversation with you. We're going to have to do this again ahead of basketball season two, I think. We're going to definitely have to talk talk some hoops. So that one I don't think will be as competitive as this football game will hopefully be. But (laughs) we'll we'll see. It's a long way. We're a long way from Big 12 play. So, Shreyas, thank you so much for taking the time, uh, for for dropping some great knowledge for us. Um, And uh, we'll see what happens on Saturday. You know, we'll see what happens. (laughs) Yeah, it'll be a lot of fun. I, will I see you in a, the press box there? I will be up in the. I'll be on the field and, and in the press box. I'll, I do some photography. And then if, yeah. depending on, I, I spent the whole second half of the SMU game in the press box because I was done melting in the sun for that result. <laughs> that's like, fair. I have that's I have standards and I have rules and and that's that's I go inside when we're bad and that's just the way it works. So <laughs> understandable. I get it. I get it. <laughs> All right. Appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Awesome. What a great conversation. Uh, super thankful for Shreyas. I know that he's got a busy week in and out up there in, in Kansas City covering all of the things that he covers. So I'm thankful that he sat down with Melissa to break down the game a little bit. Now let's jump in. This is a conversation I had earlier this week with Kendall Rogers of D1 Baseball talking a lot about TCU and some of the national landscape, some of the main storylines, maybe a little Jim Schlossnagel conversation in there as well. Why don't you go ahead and give it a listen? All right, folks, we are here with a big time guest on the Frogs Insider podcast presented by the Flying Tea Club. I've got Kendall Rogers of D1 Baseball with me today. Kendall, man, I appreciate you taking the time to hop on the show. Yeah, you got it. Hey, what what, what can we do to get Lowe's to put the uh, Flying TCU logo on a hat? Oh, he's got to get uh, a little bit of a lo- licensing uh, from from a guy who owns the Flying T logo. I don't know if really? you know the backstory on this. So a TCU football player in the 80s actually designed the logo, mm. loaned it to the school who used it on uniforms for quite yeah. a while, um, had a falling out with the university, said they couldn't use it anymore, and just recently relicensed it to the university for apparel only. So there is a new hat with the flying T logo on it, but it's not going to be on any, any uniforms at all moving forward. Oh, it was also, I, I, also I like the worst, world. worst time in TCU football history as far as winning goes. So I don't think <laughs> it, it might be cursed. Who knows? It might be yeah, cursed. You, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's back in like the, I, I'm like aging myself. That was, that was before the Max Naki days, wasn't it? I believe so. Yeah. 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 It was so it was like, early eighties. It 80s. was Naki then Ladanian after him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that was a long time ago. I just, I've always loved that logo. So it is a good logo. A baseball hat. It is a good logo. Maybe one day. Maybe one day. TCU baseball, baseball is a little hat. different when that was on a baseball hat too. So it's true. Yeah, I don't think the outfield had a fence at that <laughs> point. So they've come a, they've come quite a long way. I remember like the old field had like the almost had like what was like a now you would call it a berm, I guess. But back then it was like a concrete embankment, right? Like in yep. left field. That's mm-hmm. what I thought. Yeah, just kind of like a big concrete hill, really. Not kind of think think the Astros old center field, but just out of stone. It's kind of yeah. kind of what they had going. Well, man, I appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely. We're gonna we're gonna get into a bunch of stuff today, but I wanted to start with a little just kind of college landscape mm-hmm. uh, conversation here because you had a really interesting conversation on the D one podcast a while back talking about the impact of NIL and scholarship changes to college baseball, but then particularly to private universities. I think you talked about it in the context of Wake Forest. But yeah. it, it applies, I think, to TCU and to Vandy and to some of these other private schools as well. Just what's your what's your take on how the changes to the to NIL and the scholarship limits are going to impact private institutions like TCU? Yeah, I think the biggest thing for me is like, what will the conferences allow? So, uh, and that that's kind of square one because if you look at the ACC, SEC, Big Twelve, et cetera. One of the big things that people are discussing right now is like, okay, do we make it where, you know, Big 12 schools can only have 18 uh, if you're the Big 12? Do we make it if you're the SEC? We're going to 
you know, we're going to make the limit artificially 24 instead of allowing 34. Uh, well, there's, there's a, there's a thought process out there that in the age of, you know, being sued uh, by schools and things like that, as we're seeing where, you know, we saw Florida state basically challenge the ACC over grant or rights and things like that. You know, some conferences are saying, Hey, let, let's just let every team do what they want and we'll go from there. So I think for TCU, I mean, if, if I'm being honest, I think for TCU, the best thing ever would be for the Big 12 to go, hey, you do what you want to do. Because I can tell you right now, just from just past experiences, I don't think Kansas is, is giving 34 fools out. I don't think Kansas State's doing it. I don't think a lot of these, these Big 12 schools, at least from the middle to the bottom of the league, I don't think they're going to be able to do it. I don't think they're going to be able to afford it. Whereas I do think a school like TCU, who – you know, I, I would argue places just about as much emphasis on baseball, if not more than basketball to some degree. Um, I, I think they would like without a doubt that they could fund 34 full scholarships. So I, I think whether it's private or public, I think what conferences aside as the limit or just letting everybody do what they want, I think is the ultimate determinant on how this affects programs like TCU. I, I, I think a program like TCU is in a really good position moving forward, and I think the only thing that can kind of hold them back is if the Big 12 says, hey, listen, hold on a second. Like, Kansas is only going to offer 18, so everybody else has to do the same thing. Uh, that could change the game a little bit because if the SEC says you can do what you want, and let's just say Oklahoma, Texas, Texas A&M are all at 34 fools, Meanwhile, TCU stuck at 18 because of the Big 12 mandate changes the game a little bit, changes the math a little bit. So uh, I think that'll pretty much determine what happens moving forward. I, I'm, I kind of wish the conferences would just do let, let teams do what they want to do because I think the programs, let's face it, at the end of the day, the programs that matter, I think will we'll maximize it um, more often than not. That's a good point because, I mean, there are programs who just are never going to invest in baseball. No. And so lowering the, it almost feels like no child left behind to an extent where, okay, well, we're going to play to the lowest yeah. common denominator in the league. That doesn't really make sense because then you're handcuffing a TCU or a Texas Tech where, or an Oklahoma State even, uh, where they're just not going to be competitive at the highest. Yeah, level. well, that's been college baseball for the last 30 years is, is catering to the lowest common denominator. I mean, mm -hmm. from, hey, let's move the season back. Well, so the northern schools can compete. Okay, well, if you're the northern school, why don't you put more money into baseball? We'll consider moving the season back a little, a little heavier. Uh, you know, like college baseball is known for catering to the little guys more so than the schools that matter. It, whereas, um, you know, sports like basketball and football, I feel like do the opposite. Like they basically make the rules for the big programs and everybody else just has to follow suit. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's, it'll be interesting because, you know, so, uh, Jeremiah Donati, TCU's athletic director, did come out recently and say that, TCU isn't going to add any scholarships to sports. They are going to reallocate scholarships hmm. to sports because he wants to maximize he wants to maximize revenue sharing. Um, and you think about the cost to a school adding going from eleven point seven to thirty four, even for a, an institution like TCU. I mean, you're talking you know seventy five thousand dollars per scholarship per year, and yeah. uh, it's you know it's a, it's a big cost to the university. So what so. sport? I mean, what sport on campus does the, the t people on TC feel like would, would suffer the brunt if they reallocate? Uh, probably all the non-rev. So there are six yeah. sports that are on TV. And the indication that I've gotten from the athletics mm -hmm. department is that those are the six sports that are going to see priority when it comes to scholarship allotment and rev sharing. Makes sense. So um, if, you're, if you're a part of the TV contract, if you're part of bringing in that revenue, you're going to see your fair share of that revenue. So baseball is not necessarily going to be down anything or suffering too much because of that yeah. but I, i'm curious to see ultimately you know if you're if you're dropping 20 extra on football if you've got to add two more to men's basketball you've got a cap at 34 for baseball mm -hmm. what actually happens to some of these other sports at tcu as well yeah and here's the other thing too here's kind of a two-pronged answer to, to this discussion is you know one of the things right now that you cannot do with these new these, these rules in the settlement is you know tcu for instance kirk sarlos can't go out and get um you know a big donor to give you know a million a year to basically fund more scholarships right now it has to be part of, as you mentioned the revenue sharing model where there is a there is a a thought process out here that if hey if you're going to tell us this all has to be part of a revenue share model 
like we should be able to go out and actually fundraise for these scholarships. Like, you know, if you, if you're TCU and, you know, Nolan Ryan or Reed Ryan says, Hey, I'll shit, I'll give you a, you know, a million dollars over two years to fund, you know, mm-hmm. six, seven scholarships. Yeah. Why not? Like, why shouldn't yeah. they be able to, it takes less of a burden off the school. So I would keep an eye on that moving forward. I think that's something that could, could change. I, I think the goalposts could shift on that a little bit. The other thing is we should find out by tomorrow. I want to say uh, whether or not the NCA and the, in the, uh, the plaintiffs, uh, if they want to settle or go to trial right now, I've heard it's 50, 50. Mm-hmm. The bad news is if they go to trial, it sounds like they probably won't even set a date for the trial until the middle of the end of next year. If they go to trial, it wouldn't start till what, uh, the middle of 26. And by the way, remember, even if they come to decision in 26, there's a thing called the appeals process. So that the biggest news of all of this, honestly, is the news that's coming either t- uh, tomorrow or Friday is do they settle? Because if they do not settle, we are st- staying at 40 man rosters. We're staying at 11.7 for probably three to four more years. Yeah. It's, and you know, that's just going to put more and more schools further and further behind the eight ball when it comes to fundraising for NIL. I don't think uh, many schools can, can swim yeah, in this and- model for much longer. Yeah, the, the other thing is the, the problem with the NCA is going to have is, you know, one of the one of the things the judge pointed out was, hey, like you're you're putting guardrails on NIL, like that that goes against kind of what this is all about. Like how how are you going to say, uh, you know, how are you going to say that you that a kid can't get more than X amount? Because at the end of the day, uh, the the market is what the market's willing to pay, mm-hmm. and you know if you're uh, you know, if you're the top recruit in, in football and and you're, you know, you're decorating more and you want to go to TCU and they're willing to pay you four million dollars. Well, the, the market is what they were willing to pay you. So how can you say, well, that's not legitimate? Well, somebody thinks it's legitimate. So that's all that matters. So I just don't think the NCA has a leg to stand on at all on any of these issues at this point. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to get worse before it gets better for the yeah. NCAA, and because well, of that, though, day, yeah, mm-hmm, and because of that, it's going to punish it's going to punish the schools, right? I mean, we're already seeing mm-hmm. like, hey, if if they got to the point where the settlement is accepted later this week, yeah. you're already down two million dollars in your budget for every school that's participating in the basketball tournament. So uh, if if you go to trial and then four years from now, oh hey, actually that number is going to be five million per school. Um, I just I just don't see how this is sustainable in its current model. It's and if not, it takes four it, years to figure out. I think a lot 100%, of people are going to be really hurt. Jamie, and I, and I think the other thing, too, is like I don't think we're even done with other lawsuits. I mean, you, you oh, saw no, Reggie yeah. Bush come out mm-hmm. saying he's going to sue. What was it? Uh, Denard Robinson and a group of Michigan players uh, you know, sued a couple of weeks ago. The Texas rowing team uh, has a lawsuit out there. So, I mean, we're not even close to done with these lawsuits. No, and we're so, not. Uh, it's it's going to get nasty. It is. It really is. Well, I appreciate your insight on that. Let's let's sure. shift to, to to TCU baseball specifically. Mm-hmm. 2024 is a year that the Horn Frogs just want to flush. They want to get rid of it out of their memory. Third time in the last 20 years they didn't make the postseason. Uh, in your estimation, just from your perspective, what were some of the key things that went wrong for TCU last season? Well, I think the biggest thing for me is when I look back at this team going into the season, um, you know, obviously they got off to, you know, a really solid start. But I think when you go back to last season, I think, you know, a couple of the key guys that, you know, we all kind of expected, and, and granted injuries played their part here, but I mean, a couple of guys that we all kind of expected to have huge years, you know, Carson Bowen's a guy, I mean, obviously I really like him, uh, but, you know, he hit well under 250. You know, Anthony Silva, first round talent. Uh, exceptionally talented player, you know, hit well under 300. He was a guy that was expected to, uh, you know, have a great year. You know, Curtis Byrne, a, a guy who's, I mean, at this point, I, I don't even know how many bats he has in his college career, but it's a lot, right? Yeah. And, you know, he hit around 270. So I don't think you have to go too far to kind of figure out what some of the issues were. You know, Cole Clucker, uh, he was a prime example. You know, I wouldn't say he had a quote-unquote horrible year. But, again, you go from a guy who – was a Friday night starter for a super regional team and teams hit what three Oh six against him last year. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it was just a, it, it was a compound set of issues that kind of caused them to have a, you know, a, a less than seller year with that said, they still won uh, 33 games and you can make an argument. They should have been in the postseason. So, uh, you know, there, there were bright spots, you know, uh, you know, Peyton Tolley having the year that he did. I mean, I, there's, there's probably honestly nobody in college baseball I respect more, 
uh, after last year than what he had to go through and the, the, the success he had despite what he went through, uh, you know, going into the season. Uh, I know Lois was really excited about it. You know, Sam Myers is kind of a consummate spark plug. Uh, he had a really nice year for them. So, there, you know, I know they don't have totally, but there are some things they can build on. You know, they get some of these guys back. And, uh, you know, it was just a little bit of an up and down year. Uh, and, mm. and it happens, especially when, um, you know, you're, you're battling somebody with a 80 on the committee for the final Big 12 postseason spot. Yeah, that's a tough. That's a tough one to swallow when you see the, yeah. North, the NC State guy out there out there shilling for his team and uh, a couple of yeah. What was well, it? Every but, well, it was like what four committee members had bubble teams and they all got in. Yep, uh, it was so, NC State. Yeah, it, it was Coastal. Uh, a lot of East Coast. A lot of East Coast happening out there. Yeah, Kansas State. Casey oh, Scott. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. That's and the biggest one. That's the toughest pill for TCU fans yeah. to swallow, I think. Uh, but you know. I, I, Despite last year, the disappointment that it was, like you said, you get a lot of guys back. Silva and Bowen come back for their junior year. Silva mm-hmm. was a little bit of a draft risk as a draft-eligible sophomore. He ends up back on campus. Chase Brunson, who had a really good start to his freshman year before getting yeah. dinged up, he's coming back. Plus, you bring in – I think TCU came away pretty unscathed when it comes to the MLB draft this year. They lose Blake Larson, but they bring in Noah Franco, Sawyer Snow Snyder, Mason Brassfield, a couple of these really talented freshmen – not to mention Tommy Lapore, Jack Bell, Isaac Cadena out of the transfer portal as well. It feels like Los is starting to really build a, a roster here that feels like TCU can bounce back pretty quickly. No, I agree. I, I would be floored at those guys that, the, that we mentioned that didn't have great offensive years. If that continues next year, I, I agree with you on Brunson. I think he, assuming he stays healthy, he's going to take a step forward. Uh, you know, Sam Myers, obviously back that's going to be really exciting so the pieces are there offensively then you mentioned Lapore. you know he was a guy that uh you know had a you know really good summer it was up to, i think he's up to 94 95 you know really good slider 80 82 uh over, you know over the summer and the spring was generating a whiff rate over 40 percent so you know he gives them a really nice weapon and uh you know some of these other guys like you mentioned as, as well you know i saw a, a video the other day of noah franco i think it might have even been from one of their first fall workouts you know, he was kind of put on a show. So I, I think this program's in, in really good shape moving forward. There's there's nothing out there after this past season that makes me go, oh, there's, found, there, there's cracks in the foundation. Uh, anything but that. Yeah, and you, so you think about that. You think about the coaching shuffle as well with TJ yeah, just taking the head coaching job over at Long Beach. Uh, I think it'll be great for him go back to his alma mater out in California again. And then a familiar face comes to town with Bill Moziello. Uh, what was your reaction to hearing that Mosiello was coming back to TCU? Yeah, I mean, M- Mos and TCU just seem synonymous. And, you know, and, I, and I'll say this. Uh, I think the TJ Bruce move is honestly probably great for both parties. I know there, uh, I know TJ's always wanted a head coaching job. TJ's really wanted the head coaching job at his alma mater. Uh, and then on the flip side, uh, I mean, I think we would all be lying if we didn't say that TCU fans were a little frustrated at, you know, some of the offensive numbers, some of the offensive philosophy last year. So it's one of the classic great cases to where he got the head coaching job he wants and TCU not only went in and got a new hitting coach, they went and got one of the best in the business and a guy that obviously, uh, like his, his you know, rap sheet at TCU is incredible. So, uh, you know, to go to a Big Ten school and get a sitting head coach at Ohio State University to come back as your top assistant and a hitting coach, and I know there's a family element here too, Wanted to be cl- closer to his family, if I if I'm not mistaken, I don't think they ever actually moved from Aledo to mm. Columbus. So there is a family element there, but still, to get him to come back, uh, I think it's a it's a great move for the program, uh, and you know, obviously one of the premier you know hitting hitting minds uh, in college baseball. And then here's the other thing: this is a guy that has shown a lot of commitment to TCU. I mean, when when Jim Schlossingle left TCU, uh, he could have very easily gone to A and M. He chose to stay at TCU, and now he's back home. So I, I think it's pretty exciting for a program that, frankly, I think as you look back to last year, really wants a kind of a shift in identity from an offensive standpoint. So when you think about TCU in 2025, looking at the Big 12 without Texas, without Oklahoma, yeah. bringing in Arizona, bringing in Arizona State, uh, what's your assessment of where big where TCU maybe stacks up in, in the conference this season? I would think it'd be pretty good. I mean, I did, I'd have to look at the other teams, but you know, Texas Tech honestly is a program I'm a little concerned about. I just, I feel like if you look at the last couple of seasons, I feel like their talent level, particularly on the mound, has just kind of gotten a little bit less, a little bit less. Uh, I, I'm a little worried about them in the new look Big Twelve. I do like 
uh, the additions of Arizona and Arizona State a lot. I, I feel like you know Arizona and Arizona State's really kind of hit California and the West Coast states a lot. Now they can go into California. They can stay in Arizona recruit. They can now have a pretty significant presence in the state of Texas. So actually, I love those two additions for the Big 12. I, I think it adds a lot. Uh, not only in tradition, but in terms of what they can do in the future. Uh, you know, you add, you know, UCF to the fold a program that uh, I think has a ton of potential. Uh, obviously, you know, they were in there last year, but, they, you know, they have a ton of potential. And since, you know, we Cincinnati is like another unknown, right? Like Jordan Bischel, who's like the uh, – apparently is like a magician because like everywhere he goes, they stink. And all of a sudden the next year they're awesome. You know, Cincinnati almost made the NCAA tournament last year. So – there, the Big 12 as a whole, I think, is in a really good spot with that OU in Texas, which is kind of interesting. You think, oh, we lose OU in Texas, this league's in trouble. Uh, far from it. I think this league's in a really good position. Uh, and, and But with that said, I, I think TCU is just fine. I think, if anything, I think there's programs like Baylor, uh, you know, to a, to a greater degree. But, you know, Texas Tech's kind of declined a little bit. Oklahoma State. I'm a little concerned about them recruiting against Arkansas. You know, they're, they're kind of getting that both ends over there in the recruiting spectrum of OU on one side and Arkansas on the other, both in the SEC, trying to get guys from them. I want to see how Oklahoma State does in the next few years from a recruiting standpoint. But I think TCU's in a, in a great spot. You know, they obviously recruit. Uh, they can recruit nationally. They obviously have a great presence in the Metroplex. The location's awesome. And, uh, I mean, that staff's fantastic. So I think they're in a good spot. Yeah, I agree with you. I do think the Big 12 is in a good spot. I think TCU is in a good spot. But what's it going to take for a conference to break in to this SEC ACC arms race? Because I mean, the last look at the look at Omaha this past summer, four SEC yeah. teams, four ACC teams. It doesn't seem like there are any big shifting wins. What's it going to take for a conference like the Big 12 and for schools mm-hmm. like TCU to make sure that they can keep up? Without a doubt. I mean, NL plays a big factor. I mean, that's that's never been more important. I mean, if you go down and and I'll throw Tennessee and AM as an example here. If you're a if you're a TCU alum or you're a TCU booster and you're looking at ways you can help the baseball program, I can tell you right now, AM and Tennessee, I would be willing to bet this coming year that their NIL numbers for their whole baseball team is probably like in the three to four million dollar range. I mean, you think of some of the figures of some of the AM guys that came back to your Jay Slavalette, you know, Ryan Prager turned out 1.3 million to go back to AM. So, yep. I mean, it gives you an idea of what they're giving guys to stay put. So, you, you always say you go into these situations knowing what your, I say enemies, but like knowing what your opponents are doing and programs that they're recruiting against in the national landscape Texas, Texas AM, Tennessee. These programs, let's be honest, for the next few years, are going to have NL budgets for baseball of two to three million dollars, and so that's the that's the first thing. I think the second thing for me, in terms of the, the Big Twelve as a whole, uh, I, I, I know this sounds a little odd, but like I, I think Arizona, Arizona State surging would be really good for that conference. I think if you're the Big Twelve, if you can get ASU, which is a national brand, one of the historic powers in college baseball, I do think there's more money. Uh, available to Arizona State than, than what they have right now. I think if they were winning, I think they would actually have a pretty robust NL operation. Uh, you know, and then Arizona, you know, they, they were good last year. I mean, they hosted a regional. I think it was West Virginia won the regional last year. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've been good. They haven't been great. So I think those two programs taking a step up and kind of filling that void that like a Texas or OU had would be really important for this league in terms of just, you know, getting to the postseason and, and making a move. The, the fact of the matter is, You've got to put yourself in a position as a league and as a program to host as a top 16 because the data would show that, for the most part, teams that host are, are advancing you know, 60 to 70% of the time. So the key is just hosting. How do you do that? Uh, you know, Fund the program and otherwise get the players you need. You know, Win your non-conference games. Uh, and then in a conference like the, the Big 12, I think it's in a really good RPI state. As long as you have a good year, you're going to be in the discussion to be a top 16, and that puts you in a pretty good position to advance. Well, that's just about as thorough an analysis as I could have <laughs> hoped for. So I really do appreciate a lot you. Of La- parts there. Yeah, a lot of moving parts for sure. All right, last question. This is one I didn't prep you for, but uh, what's yeah. one storyline that people should be paying attention to? Doesn't necessarily have to be related to TCU, just a college baseball storyline that you're really interested in this fall. Well, you know what? I'll, I will stay in the Lone Star State. Um, I, I think the 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 years that Texas A&M and Texas have, um, obviously TCU fans 
know all about this drama. But, you know, with, with, with Schloss moving to Texas, uh, A&M is in a really unique spot. I mean, if you think about Michael or really a guy who literally has uh, – he's been a full-time coach for two years, a full-time assistant coach. I like it, – it'd be like, you know, somebody inheriting like 15 Lam- Lamborghinis or something – and going okay uh now we just you know now we just need you to drive down the street you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and for for him to have that situation they'll probably be a top one or two team in the country in preseason the year that they have will be fascinating i mean that's a lot of pressure for a first year coach i think on the flip side if you're if you're jim uh if you leave a m for texas and you go to Texas, like you better have a really good year because, as we know, whether it's football, basketball, baseball, there is no such thing as a honeymoon in Austin. Mm-hmm. And you know how they navigate year one in the SEC. You know they play Florida, they play A uh, and M. Uh, you know I, I think they I think they play Tennessee. I know they play LSU, but they play Tennessee or LSU. So the year that he has, I will say this about Texas: uh, they remind me a lot of his first uh, his first team they had at A and M. And they were really offensive, which I think Texas will be with Blue and Flores back. But, you know, pitching-wise, they have a lot of improvements, which is kind of what A&M had 2022. 20, so don't be surprised that they get to Omaha. But just the, just the storylines between those two programs, you know, the, can A&M live up to expectations with a new coach and with that kind of roster? And, you know, can Jim make a move at Texas in year one in the toughest league in, in college baseball? That will be fascinating to me. Texas uh, goes on the road to Arkansas this year, on the road to Kentucky, on the road to Missouri and Mississippi Oof. State, uh, LSU, Georgia, Auburn, A&M, and Florida all at home, not to mention on the road at Oklahoma as well. That is a gauntlet. That, that is, is a gauntlet, gauntlet, and I will say this. Um, you know, if you look at the next year, I think T- Tennessee and A&M might play in Knoxville. But, I mean, you could argue – that Texas or A and M at Texas next year is like the most anticipated series in college baseball, at least on yeah. paper going into the season. Just for all the all the that reasons, will really. be a zoo. <laughs> Looking forward to it, man. Well, TCU, Kendall, TCU fans are back here with like a just, cigar going. Yeah, a little, hey, little popcorn. Ain't ours anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's your problem now, buddy. Um, awesome, Kendall. Thank you so much, man, for stopping by the show. Really do appreciate you taking the time. Why don't you go ahead and tell everybody where they can find you? Yeah, man, just d1baseball.com. We'll have a lot of fall coverage. Uh, we actually had our fall, first fall scoot piece from some scrimmages today uh, at Kendall Rogers on Twitter. And I was just talking to Jamie about it offline beforehand. But uh, I will be up in uh, Fort Worth for uh, the fall, whatever they call it, the Fall World Series at some point in November. So looking forward to seeing you, seeing some of you guys over there and certainly seeing Los and then Mo, Mo's Yellow back in town. So Mo's and I go way back. He's like he's like one of the most honest people I know in the industry. Sometimes if he's mad at you, it ain't the best thing in the world, but love me some Mo's. He's great, man, and it's been really fun to see the TCU players, especially the guys that didn't have any interaction with him from a recruiting standpoint, uh, get to know him this fall. It's oh, uh, he is a unique individual in a, in a yeah, good way, a very good way, very good way. Awesome. Well, Kendall, thank you so much for the time. We'll we'll talk again soon, man. You got it, Jamie. Be good, boss. Great, awesome. I love Kendall Rogers. If you haven't met him, like he said, he will be in Fort Worth later this fall as he takes in the Purple and White World Series. Uh, if you have a chance, come out and say hi. He's super friendly, really great guy, does an excellent job covering college baseball. That whole site over at D1 is fantastic, truly. I'm thankful for him and thankful for what they do over at D1 Baseball to promote the sport as well. That's going to do it for this episode of Frogs Insider. Simple in and out. Two interviews, bing, bang, boom, clean as a whistle. TCU in Kansas. They kick off at 2.30 Central Time on ESPN Plus at Arrowhead in Missouri. We'll see. We will see. But one thing you know for sure, regardless of what the outcome may bring, Melissa and I will be back on Sunday afternoon to talk about it, break it all down. So until then, we will talk to you next time. Go Frogs.